In today's modern world, many of us are still curious about the supernatural. Are there spirits around us that we can't see? And are they good or evil? Living Truth takes to the streets to find out what people think about demons. What are demons? Demons are agents of the devil. Helpers of the devil, supposedly. I don't. I really don't know. I. I, I don't know. And I don't uh, have any experience or any belief in something like that. Well, I, I believe that there is spirit that we can't see. I don't believe in an actual physical entity as a demon. I just think it's it's a form of a, of a state of mind or a spirit or a bad happenstance is probably what I call a demon. The demons came from people's imaginations, um, probably back in the witch hunt days when uh, people had nothing else to uh, uh, think about and uh, religion was everywhere. And I, I don't think uh, demons necessarily exist. I think they're more in people's heads. Our demons are basically fallen angels who, when Lucifer defied God, decided to go with Lucifer instead of stay in heaven. Demons are the, to me, they're the angels that chose to follow Satan and worship him and just go along his evil path rather than stay with God in the light. On today's program, Charles Price teaches us how to recognize and resist demons in Identifying Demons. I'm going to read some verses from the book of Ephesians in chapter 6. If you were here last week, we read these same verses. Ephesians chapter 6. I'm going to read from verse 10 down to verse 13. And Paul says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything, to stand. And then he goes on to talk about various ways in which we're to stand firm with the armor that we are to wear. Well, last week we began a series that I'm calling Who's Who in the Cosmos. That is, a glimpse behind the scenes to see what's going on in the invisible world because Scripture speaks about the fact that there is an invisible world that is as real as the visible world. And we are in a state of conflict with much of it, we're told. These verses we read say, a struggle. And it's a struggle is against the powers of this dark world, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. There is a world consisting of God and of Satan, of angels and of demons, of good and of evil. And we need to understand what God has revealed to us about this world, because we are in conflict with much of it. Now, last week we talked about Satan, the devil, but today I want to talk to you about demons, because Scripture speaks not just of Satan, one individual, living being, who is at enmity with all that God is in favor of. He's at enmity with God, and therefore he's at enmity with everything which represents God. But there is a whole army of demons, Scripture tells us, which work together with him. They're described sometimes as evil spirits. Now, there are about 110 references altogether in Scripture, mainly in the New Testament, but also some in the Old Testament, to other demons or to evil spirits. And I'm going to ask two simple questions tonight. Firstly, who are demons? That's the first question. And then secondly, what do demons do? And we'll try and confine our understanding to what Scripture teaches on these important areas. First of all, who are demons? And this is a question, it is not easy to answer. The Bible does not anywhere explicitly state who demons are, where they came from, how they exist in the first place. And so as a result, there are several different explanations that have arisen over the history of the church. So I'm going to give you three of them. The first 
is that the origin of demons is found in Genesis chapter 6. And in that passage, there is a, a difficult thing to understand, where it says in verse 1, when men began to increase in number on the earth, and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were beautiful, and they married any of them they chose. Then the Lord said, My spirit will not contend with man forever, for he is mortal. His days will be 120 years. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days. And also afterwards, when the sons of God went to the daughters of men and had children by them, and they were the heroes of old, men of renown, and the Lord saw how great man's wickedness on the earth had become, and that every inclination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil all the time. And the Lord was grieved that he had made man on the earth, and his heart was filled with pain. And so as a consequence, God planned the flood in which the whole human race, with the exception of Noah and his family, were destroyed. Now, the big question is, who are these sons of God who married the daughters of men? And one idea put forward is that the sons of God were angels, there is another case when angels are referred to as sons of God. In the book of Job, for instance, it talks about uh, the sons of God came to meet with him and Satan was amongst them. So it speaks of angels as sons of God, but actually it doesn't just exclusively speak of angels as sons of God. It talks of, uh, of Christians as being sons of God as well. We're children of God. But it does speak of angels elsewhere. And this idea is that these sons of God were angels who intermarried with the daughters of men who were humans, and they produced Nephilim, which were giants, it says, as a result. And that these either died in the flood or in uh, battle. It speaks of them becoming heroes of old, and normally heroes were those who had died in battle. And that the result was what we today know as demons. The sons of man intermarrying, sons of God intermarrying with the daughters of men. There are several problems with that. By the way, there's a book, one of the apocryphal books called Enoch, which also describes this as the origin of demons, but these are apocryphal books and we don't treat them with the authority uh, we attribute to Scripture. Now, there are several objections to this. One is that angels have never been mentioned this far in the Genesis account. There's been no mention of angels so far. It would seem unlikely that their first appearances would be in this sort of uh, disguised form, sons of God, rather than as they are later described simply as angels. But the second and bigger problem is that Jesus said that angels are sexless. They do not marry. In Matthew 22, verse 30, Jesus said, The resurrection people neither marry nor be given in marriage. They'll be like the angels in heaven. And they are incapable of reproduction. And so the idea that these are angels intermarrying with humans and producing Nephilim, who in turn became demons, I think is a very weak uh, position, though it's one which has been held through the centuries by various people. The other explanation for the sons of God and the daughters of men in Genesis is that the sons of God were the sons of Seth. Seth's line was godly. It was a line that called on the name of the Lord. And then there was the other line. There were two lines from Adam. One was the line of Cain. And Cain's line was corrupt. And they were running from God. And they'd gone away. Cain went away, remember, and took his wife and built a city somewhere else. And now they meet again. They intermarry. And that's the more likely explanation of this passage. The second explanation that's sometimes given is the demons are the spirits of a pre-Adamic race that perished between verses 1 and verses 2 of the book of Genesis. See, Genesis chapter 1 says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And then there is the belief, some hold, that there is a huge gap then. We, it's unspecified as to how wide this gap is between verse 1 and then verse 2, which says, Now the earth was formless and empty, darkness over the surface of the deep. And during that unspecified period of time, 
before God started again in verse 2, there was a, a race that preceded Adam that were judged by God and became demons. Now, the only indication in Scripture that such an event took place is in the book of Jeremiah, chapter 4. Let me read it to you. Jeremiah, chapter 4, and verse 23. Jeremiah says, I looked at the earth, and it was formless and empty. That's exactly the description given in Genesis 1, verse 2. I looked at the earth, it was formless and empty, and at the heavens, and their light was gone. I looked at the mountains, and they were quaking at the hills, and the hills were swaying. I looked, and there were no people. Every bird in the sky had flown away. I looked, and the fruitful land was a desert. All its towns lay in ruins before the Lord, before his fierce anger. Now, some have taken this insight, this prophetic insight of Jeremiah, and stuck it between verse 1 and verse 2 and say there was a, a pre-Adamic period. This helps to account for some archaeological evidences for, for, for time that goes back before Adam. So, those who hold this position might say, and that during that period there was a race that was judged and perished under the wrath of God, and they have come back as spirits to haunt us in the form of demons. Now, it's the least of these three positions held probably within the Christian church, but it is a position that's been held historically. Now, it seems to me that the most logical is that when Satan rebelled in heaven, he was joined in his rebellion by a group of other angels, and these fallen angels, along with Satan himself, Lucifer, a fallen angel, have become his demons. They have a similar origin to Lucifer himself. And the basis of that conclusion is that Satan himself was once an angel. So why are not demons once angels? Also we're told in his rebellion, Satan was not alone. In Revelation chapter 12 and verse 9, it says the great dragon, it says Satan was hurled down, that ancient serpent called the devil or Satan who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to earth and his angels with him. So clearly there was a rebellion involved more than just Lucifer. There were angels that joined him in his rebellion. And it seems there were two groups of angels. One of those groups was sent immediately to hell. We're told that in 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 4. It says, God did not spare angels when they sinned, but sent them to hell, putting them into gloomy dungeons to be held for judgment. 2 Peter 2 verse 4. So that some have been sent straight to hell. The book of Jude, which has only one chapter in verse 9, says, Angels who did not keep their positions of authority, but abandoned their own home, those he has kept in darkness, bound with everlasting chains for judgment on the great day. Those are the only two verses that give us any indication about them. We have no more detail, but they have been cast into gloomy dungeons, bound with everlasting chains. They're already in hell, and therefore they do not concern us. They do not attack us. We, 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 we know about them only this little insight. It's intriguing, but they're not demons as we deal and maybe combat with them today. That's one group of angels sent straight to hell. Why some were sent straight to hell? Scripture doesn't tell us. But there's another category who was sent to earth. And in Revelation chapter 12, you have an insight that I believe is retrospective. It's surveying the ages. And in chapter 12, verse 3, it says, Another sign appeared in heaven, an enormous red dragon with seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns on his heads. His tail swept a third of the stars out of the sky and flung them to the earth. That might indicate that up to one third of the angels joined him in his rebellion. And again, angels are sometimes referred to as stars. And Lucifer himself was the morning star. Indication that a third of the angels fell with him, flung to the earth. Because as verse 9 says, that great dragon was hurled down, that ancient serpent called the devil who leads the whole world astray, he was hurled to the earth and his angels with him. Then Revelation 12 and verse 9. So that's an answer to the question, who are demons? The second question is, what do demons do? 
And basically, of course, demons are out to destroy the work of God. That's the bottom line of what they're doing. And I want to give to you from Scripture three specific things that are attributed to the devil and to demons. There are actually a number of things. In fact, I came up with a list of 12 things demons do altogether. But I'm going to give you three today. And these three really encompass many of the other things that are attributed to Satan and demons. And uh, we do put them together in some of these areas. Some of the things attributed to Satan are also attributed to demons. And uh, remember, uh, we pointed out last week that the devil is not omnipresent. He's not in all places at all times, as God is in all places at all times. Satan travels and moves to and fro throughout the earth, we're told in the book of Job. And therefore, there are things which are attributed to Satan, which are really the work of demonic forces, because they operate under his authority and his direction. As I said last week, much the way in which you might say Hitler invaded Poland. Meanwhile, Hitler was not in Poland, he was back home in Berlin. But his forces, under his authority, invaded Poland. And in that sense, the scripture speaks of Satan attacking and Satan doing things which are carried out by his representatives, his agents, demons. Now, the first thing is that demons tempt people to sin. That's the most basic. In fact, in John chapter 13 and verse 2, it says the evening meal was being served. This is in the upper room. And the devil had already prompted Judas Iscariot, son of Simon, to betray Jesus. He prompted Judas Iscariot. No indication of demonic possession there. It's that he prompted him. And I suppose we could say that tempting people to sin is the bread and butter business of demons and Satan. It's their nine to five job. <laughs> there are other things they do too, but this is the basic. This is where satanic forces will be involved right across the board in every life. They do not possess everyone. They don't have access to possess everyone, but they will tempt everyone. In First Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 5, Paul says to the Thessalonians that he was trying to find out how they were doing because he said, I was afraid that the tempter may have tempted you and our efforts might have been useless. Because I know that's the tempter's business. That's why it's called the tempter. De the devil's business is to tempt you, to lead you astray. And he says, I was fearful that may have happened. We know about the temptations of Jesus carried out by Satan himself in the wilderness. And we are warned that we are going to face temptation. Let me say this, that not all temptation is from the devil. There is temptation which comes from our own sinful nature, Scripture tells us. In James chapter 1 and verse 13, James writes, When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when by his own evil desires. He is dragged away and enticed. Then after desire is conceived, that is, you've given it room. After desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it's full grown, gives birth to death. Don't be deceived, my dear brothers. Now he's saying, listen, if the devil were to die tonight, and the demons were to die tonight, and go to hell tonight, you would sin tomorrow, in all probability, because we have a nature that when its own natural desire is aroused, will sin. There are lots of things in your life that don't need the devil to tempt you. Your own natural desires will be there. You see, sexual temptation doesn't need to come from the devil. He, of course, exploits that. He exploits all our appetites. But your, the way you've been made will simply create sexual desire and expose you to sexual temptation. Simply the way you've been created. And if your old nature is not under control, we were fed in those areas without necessarily any satanic involvement at all. It's also important to understand that God places limits on the temptations to which we are exposed. The devil does not work carte blanche. He doesn't just have freedom to roam and do whatever he wants to do across the earth. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 13, Paul writes, No temptation has taken you except that which is common to man. We're all in the same boat here. 
But he says, God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you're tempted, he'll also provide a way out so that you can stand up under it. Now he says, God puts boundaries on the temptation we're exposed to. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. And we know because we have insight in several cases when God gave permission to Satan to attack and to tempt. We know that in the story of Job. There was not so much temptation, it was just to, to attack him and destroy things which belonged to him, including his own family, and then to bring sickness into his body. And God gave permission to Satan for that. God set the boundaries. He said, don't touch his body first time round. Second time round, okay, now you can touch his body, but don't touch his life. God puts the limits on, the parameters on. We know Simon Peter was, uh, the night before he was, he, he denied Jesus. Jesus said to him, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you like wheat, and I'm praying for you, your faith will not fail. The implication is, permission has been granted, but it will not be beyond what you can bear, though Simon Peter did fall and denied Jesus. God sets parameters on it. Now, I remember once, over a period of time, years ago, looking at this verse and saying, to be absolutely honest, I simply don't believe this verse, that God will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. Because I knew I was facing temptation that seemed beyond my ability to resist them. And although I would fall, I would confess, I would fall again very quickly. Confess the same thing, fall again very quickly, confess the same thing. And I said, is this really true that he will not let us be tempted beyond what we can bear? But then I read the rest of the verse, it's always good to do that. It says, but when you're tempted, he'll also provide a way out so that you can stand up against it. My problem was I wasn't looking for the way out, there's a way out. And the important thing is, when we come under temptation, whether it's from the flesh or whether it's from Satan and demons, whose job is to tempt us and to trip us up and to seduce us, there's a way out. Look for the way out. And that's the key. So Satan tempts and demons tempt us. The second thing they do, and this is specifically applied to demons, is they possess people. This is especially true in the New Testament. There are only a few examples in the Old Testament in 1 Samuel chapter 16 and verse 14, after Saul had failed as king over Israel, it says the Spirit of the Lord had departed from Saul and an evil spirit from the Lord tormented him. Now this is in the pre-Pentecost era. After Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came to live permanently to seal his presence in the hearts of believers. But in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit came for particular tasks, and then sometimes left after that task was completed. Now, in the case of Saul, when he was anointed king, the Spirit of God anointed him, and then he was withdrawn, and it says, intriguingly, an evil spirit from the Lord tormented him. What that must mean is that as a result of the withdrawal of the Holy Spirit, as Jesus said one day, you clean out the evil. If you don't put, put, replace it with the good, demons come back seven times worse. And now an evil spirit. Not so much that God sent an evil spirit, I think it must mean, but the vacuum meant that an evil spirit began to occupy Saul. And you know how Saul went from bad to worse and eventually got caught up in occult practices and consulting the dead and so on. But uh, there you have an evil spirit. And then in 1 Kings chapter 22, you have a very strange and difficult, to be honest, a difficult case where a prophet called Micaiah talks about the Lord calling his angels and his, uh, his host before him. And he said, how am I going to get King Ahab to attack Ramoth Gilead and in the process get himself killed? King Ahab was one of the evil kings in Israel, in the Old Testament, married to an evil woman, Jezebel. And Micaiah tells the story that I saw the Lord with all his hosts gathered around him. And I said to them, and the Lord said to his host, how can I get Ahab into battle at Ramoth Gilead? And he says, so one spirit came and said this, another spirit came and said that, another spirit came and said something else. And none of these ideas were, were good, says Micaiah, until the spirit came and said, I know what to do. I will go and be a lying spirit in the prophet's will speak to Ahab and will lead him into this battle through a lying spirit 
in the prophets. And uh, Micaiah says, and the Lord said, that's good. Go and do it. That's a difficult story. Micaiah is telling a story. Is it a hypothetical story? Is it kind of a parable? Is it, a, is it just a story rather than a literal record of something that was happening in heaven? And he's saying, look, all it takes is deceit and lies to get Ahab into trouble. That's a possible explanation. The other is that if this is actually telling something factual that's being revealed to Micaiah, that God in his sovereignty, he is allowing a lying spirit to deceive Ahab because in his sovereignty he controls even evil spirits. That's a possible explanation. The emphasis certainly on the few occasions in the Old Testament that speaks about evil spirits is that they're under the ultimate control of God. It was God who permitted an evil spirit to torment Saul. In this case, God allowing a lying spirit to confuse Ahab and lead him into battle. It was God who permitted Satan, an evil spirit, as Satan is, to attack Job. So, those are only three instances, as far as I can see, when evil spirits are spoken of in the Old Testament. And every case, case, they're operating under the authority of a sovereign God who controls them and gives them their parameters and gives them permission. So maybe he permitted a lying spirit. That's one possible explanation. Not that he willed it, but permitted that in the case of Ahab, who himself was corrupt and evil. However, when you come to the New Testament, there are many more instances of demon possession. In the ministry of Jesus, in the four Gospels, and in the book of Acts, there are 32 cases of demon possession that are recorded. And it gives us some insights into demonic powers when it comes to possession. And uh, as a summary, it seems that they have both negative powers and positive powers. That is, they have powers to disable and restrict, and they have powers to enable and empower. Let me give you some of the negative, disabling powers that demons seem to have. We won't look at all these verses because it'll take too long and you probably know many of these stories from the Gospels anyway. But there are those who are dumb because of an evil spirit, because of a demon. There are those who are deaf because of demons. There are those who had convulsions because of demons. There are those who experience severe pain because of demons. There are those who are made weak and infirm because of demons. There was one man who lost his mind and was mad because of demons and lived amongst the tombs, you remember? Paul speaks about a thorn in his flesh which limited him and he said it came from the devil. In 2 Corinthians 12 verse 7, we'll read that verse. Paul says, to keep me from becoming conceited because of these surpassingly great revelations, there was given me a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. He doesn't tell us what the thorn in his flesh is. It may well have been a physical thing. It's very evident from the book of Galatians. Paul had very poor eyesight. I wrote a book on Paul on one occasion, and I consulted various commentaries on what they thought the thorn in the flesh was. And there were so many different variations, so many different suggestions, you could have produced an, uh, a medical encyclopedia on the basis of the various things suggested were Paul's problem, the thorn in the flesh. Uh, some have suggested it might be the fact that he was single and not married. Well, as a Pharisee, he should have been married, and some have suggested as evidence that he was married, and that this was the thorn in his flesh. <laughs> a wife who did not turn to Christ. Paul talks very sympathetically about those who are married to an unbeliever. You were married, and then one of you becomes a believer, and the other one is not. He says, stay with them, but if they want to leave, let them go. Maybe that was Paul's own experience. These are all speculations, of course. But the point is, although we don't know what the thorn of the flesh was, we do know its origin. He says it's a messenger from Satan. Satan sent this to me to torment me, to restrict me. And so he prayed the logical thing, Lord, take it away. And he prayed that three times, and God said, no. Isn't that interesting? God doesn't always take the devil away. He said, my strength is made perfect in weakness. And so Paul says, therefore I rejoice in my weakness. But the point is, this weakness was satanically given to him. We're told on this negative uh, disabling powers that Satan also has the power of death. Hebrews chapter 2 verse 14 says, Since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity, so that by his death he might destroy him who holds the power of death. That is the devil. 
and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. When it says Satan has the power of death, what is the power of death? I suggest to you from this verse, the power of death is the fear of death. That's its power. It makes us afraid. And if you are afraid of death, I'm sorry to tell you this, but your fear is satanic in origin. There's no need to be f- afraid of death. No need at all to be afraid of death. We simply pass through it into a much greater, better life. So these are things attributed to Satan and to demons that are negative. They disable people. They are destructive. But there are other things which are accredited, which are credited to Satan and his demons, which are are enabling powers. There's a man in Luke chapter 8 who had unusual strengths because of demonic possession. He could take chains and he would snap the chains. And they could not restrain him. They had the power to drive a whole herd of pigs into the sea on that same chapter. In Luke chapter 4, they had the power to throw a man to the ground violently. In Acts chapter 16, you find their ability to predict the future. In fact, when Paul went to Philippi first of all, he was followed by a woman who was demon-possessed who could predict the future. And uh, she made money for her owners, her pimps. And they probably set up a little tent and said, you know, if you want your future told, come to this girl. And she could tell the future because she was demon-possessed. And they had insights into the future. And she followed Paul and Silas and tormented them. And he turned to one stage and de- drove the demon out of her. And suddenly she could no longer foresee the future. And uh, her owners were so angry that a riot ensued. And Paul was thrown into prison in Philippi. You probably remember that story. But because they actually have that ability to foresee the future. Demons know something that we, things that we don't know. They are able to see the future to some extent. So they have negative abilities to disable. They have positive abilities to enable, to empower in various ways. Now, I need to ask the question, how are we to understand demon possession? Because the reality of it is unmistakable in the New Testament. There are many liberal theologians who have sought to demythologize, that's the technical term, demythologize the idea of demon possession. And to recognize it as a state of mind when natural functions such as the sex drive or hunger or anger or the craving for power take over the whole person and drive them And it's not because there is a literal demon possessing them, but because they are being overwhelmed by this drive, this power that they're yielding to in their lives. And so they say that when the New Testament speaks of demon possession, it is basically simply accommodating to the culture and beliefs of the day. Because you don't have demon possession like this anywhere in the Old Testament. And so they say this, is a, this was a, a cultural belief. And so Jesus was accommodating this. That's what some theologians have sought to explain away the idea of demonic possession. Sigmund Freud, of course, was the father of psychoanalysis. He probably encountered a number of folks who were demon possessed. And his explanation was that evil spirits are repressed guilt expressing itself in behavior. It now becomes a driving force in their lives. Now, what we must acknowledge is it is sometimes hard to distinguish between psychological disorder and demon possession because the symptoms of both can be very similar. And we're all subject to influences that affect our behavior. There are Uh, physical influences. You know, we have genetic backgrounds. Uh, We have body chemistry. Some of us inherit a tendency to depression. Sometimes the function of the brain, sometimes damage to the brain is a factor that causes us to behave the way we behave. And there are physical influences. There are psychological influences. We recognize there is some substance to psychoanalysis that says that certain things took place in your childhood and they have a consequence in your adulthood. There's often emotional trauma which uh, is working inside us. There's often hurts that are working inside us and producing 
responses and behavioral responses that seem to be out of our control. So if there are physical influences and psychological influences, there are also spiritual influences that are at work. We are subject to the temptations of the evil one. We are subject to demonic attack. And sometimes there's a combination of these factors that make us behave as we behave. And sometimes it is the physical uh, factors in our lives, sometimes the psychological factors which make us especially vulnerable to spiritual factors that might drive us and affect us. And I think we need to be very careful of seeing all unusual behavior as being manifestations of the demonic or, on the other extreme, manifestations of some psychological disorder. Because both exist, and it's interesting that Jesus distinguished between both. He treated those who were ill. He laid hands on them and said, be healed. There are others that he treated as demonized, and he drove the demon out. There are those who are dumb because of demons, and those who might have been deaf because of demons, and deaf because of simply burst eardrums. Now, there's no simple formula given to us in the New Testament regarding dealing with the demonized, those who may be demon-possessed, other than the command in the name of Jesus that they be released. And when it says in the name of Jesus, it simply means under the authority of Jesus. It's not a magic formula. If you use the name, there's something magic, but it means in, under the authority of Jesus, under his commission, I'm telling you, not because I'm telling you, but because Christ is telling you. That's what it means to be doing something in his name. You know, a very interesting instance, actually, in Acts chapter 19 and verse 11. Let me just read it to you. When some people try to jump onto this bandwagon of driving out demons, because it, they saw it as a bandwagon. Chapter 19, verse 11, it says, uh, let me read verse 11 first, God did extraordinary miracles through Paul. So that even handkerchiefs and aprons that touched him were taken to the sick and their illnesses were cured and the evil spirits left them. Some Jews who went around driving out evil spirits tried to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who were demon-possessed. And they would say, in the name of Jesus whom Paul preaches, I command you to come out. Well, that looks right so far. But listen to what it says. Seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish chief priest, were doing this. And one day, the evil spirit answered them, Jesus, I know. And I know about Paul. But who are you? And then the man who had the evil spirit jumped on them and overpowered them all. He gave them such a beating that they ran out of the house naked and bleeding. These are seven brothers against one demon-possessed man. You know, we got the formula here in the name of Jesus and Paul preaches, come out! He said, hey, Jesus I know. Interesting the language of the demon. Jesus I know, Paul I know about. But who are you? These are men who thought I can just adopt the formula rather than those who are themselves in Christ and secure in Christ. That's why Ephesians 6, when we look at this another day, says, be strong in the Lord, in His mighty power. And these men were battered and bleeding and driven out and uh, learned a big lesson. And we'll talk about the fact that we are to treat Satan and his demons with respect. We'll talk about that on another occasion too. But I want to ask a, a big question. Can demons possess Christians? Well, there is no example of that in the New Testament. And uh, I conclude, though I recognize others have concluded differently, that the answer to that is no, that demons cannot possess Christians. For the simple reason, by definition, a Christian is indwelt by the Holy Spirit. Do you not know, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 6, that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you. You're not your own, you're bought with a price. And in that same chapter, he says, what does righteousness and wickedness have in common? What fellowship can light have with darkness? What harmony is there between Christ and Belial? Now he says there, your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. He lives in you. How can there be an evil spirit alongside the Holy Spirit living in the same person. But as I heard somebody say once, Christians may not have demons, but demons can have Christians. And there is an example of that. In Acts chapter 5, but there's a man called Ananias and his wife Sapphira, and there were others who had been selling property and bringing all the money and giving it 
to the church for the use of the ministry. And Ananias and Sapphira sold a piece of land and they kept back some of the value of the land and they brought the remaining and they said, this is all the money we received for the land and we're giving it all to the church. Now, the problem with Ananias and Sapphira was, was not that they had to give all their money. They didn't know they had to give it. The problem was that they were deceptive. They claimed it was all the money, but it wasn't. They kept back something for themselves. And this is what Peter says. Peter said in verse 3, Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit? Now, when he says Satan has filled your heart, it doesn't mean that you've become possessed by Satan, but Satan has captivated your heart. Because although a believer cannot have demons, demons can have a Christian. They've got hold of Ananias, and they've got his wife, Sapphira. You see, it doesn't mean that Ananias was demon-possessed and needed exorcism, but that, he was, that Satan had captivated his heart and he needed repentance. That was the difference. But because he maintained the pretense, and his, uh, he, he dropped dead. And as they were carrying him out to bury him, or they carried him out and buried him, and as they, the men who had buried him were coming back in, this is what happened in the meetings in Acts 5. Oh, you, you've lied to the Holy Spirit, pow, he dropped dead. But somebody just go and bury him while we sing the next song, and they buried him. And as they were coming back in, his wife arrived, and they said, uh, Sapphira, was this the amount of money that you got for the land you sold? She said, that's right. Is this all of it? That's right. Why have you also conspired to lie with your husband? You hear these men coming back up the steps? You know what they've been? They've been burying your husband. What are they going to do next? They're going to bury you. <laughs> she fell over dead. Man, these are dangerous times. I mean, no wonder it says that they were filled with fear. <laughs> I mean, this is the fear of God. If a great fear seized the whole church, it says a little bit later on. But the point is the devil had got hold of Ananias. The devil had sown this seed. The devil had brought about this distortion. And... Uh, that's why we have to be careful not to give the devil a foothold. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 27 warns us, do not give the devil a foothold. Don't give him something to latch onto. If there's some unchecked area in your life, in my life, if there's some area where you feel, well, this is my, my secret sin, and usually it's the secret sins that become the foothold for the devil. Nobody else knows about this. This is my pet, my favorite. I'll build a hedge around it. Nobody knows. This takes place and nobody else knows anything about it. Be very careful. If you give the devil a foothold, he'll climb all over you. And he may not be able to possess you, but he may oppress you. We may know demonic oppression. Though with the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, we're preserved from demonic possession. Watch it if you're into pornography. And I've talked in cancer with folks who said, well, it was just a little bit. It didn't, wasn't very much, but it began to grow. You see, it never satisfies, and so it'll never stay just a little bit. So you deal ruthlessly with it. And many of us have known oppression, many of us, many of you, and I have known that. Unable to move, pinned into my bed at night. I remember on one occasion very vividly, when I was a student. And I woke up in a cold sweat, and I couldn't move. And uh, eventually, all I could do was just move my lips, and I said, in the name of Jesus, whatever's going on here, get out of here. That's all I knew what to say. Yeah. And I began to e feel an ease, and I discovered the next morning, which was Sunday morning, the Saturday night, that night, two of the students who were using the same hall of residence had brought back a guy they met on the streets. They'd been witnessing to him, and as they w were talking with him down in the, in, in, in the sort of uh, coffee area, uh, he began to manifest uh, demonic possession. They actually drove the demons out of him, and why they came to my bedroom, I don't know. But that's the only explanation I know. There's been a development in recent years concerning what has become known as territorial spirits. The idea that there are certain spiritual powers who are designated geographical areas. And therefore, if we are to effectively evangelize, we need to break these strongholds of the spirits. It's called strategic level spiritual warfare. Many of you may be familiar with some of this primarily based on a verse in Daniel chapter 10 when Daniel is speaking to an angel who assures him that his earlier prayers were heard but it says, but the prince of the Persian kingdom resisted me for 21 days 
And later in Daniel 10, verse 20, he said, Soon I'll return to fight against the prince of Persia, and when I go, the prince of Greece will come. And some see these as spirits responsible for Persia and for Greece, and they've developed a whole doctrine of strategic level spiritual warfare. And it's, it's popular, there are a number of books around, and there, there are people that you will know, I'm sure, who are involved in this. Here's from one preacher. I remember ministering in a region of Pennsylvania for about six months. After I entered the home of the person who was to receive ministry, I would discover each person beginning to suffer from the same symptoms. They were experiencing fear, an upset stomach, and buzzing in their ears. The buzzing made them feel dizzy and confused. And after three cases in a row, I directed my attention to the spirit causing this phenomenon and found I was dealing with a territorial spirit that ruled over that whole area. He didn't like what I was doing. My ministry was a threat to his rule over the people of that region. He cursed me in their minds and sometimes spoke out of their mouths. Knowing what I was dealing with, I broke the spirit's power over each individual and commanded him to leave. Immediately their physical and emotional symptoms disappeared and I was able to continue to minister and witness them set free from the powers of darkness oppressing them. I know some folks who go onto the streets of London where they worship and they preach not to the people who are standing on the streets or walking down the streets. They're preaching over them to the spirits and powers that lie behind them. And they believe once you've dealt with those powers, then the people will be free to respond to the gospel. There was certainly a city in the United States, one of the big cities, who in 1980 held a big public rally, and this was the goal of that rally, to bind Satan from the city and bring godliness to public life through spiritual warfare. The problem is there's been no change in that city. I have a friend and I read this by him today. He says, the territorial principalities will be refurbished with a whole new personnel. He's saying it is going to be a coup d'etat in the heavenly realms. And the second coming of our Lord, which is held up in the meantime, and his total reign is restrained until this takes place. To be absolutely frank with you, I think some of this is getting a bit berserk. <laughs> What is true is that Satan is called prince of this world. That is true. Jesus called him that. He is called the prince of the power of this air by Paul in Ephesians. He is called the god of this world in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. We're told he leads the whole world astray in the book of Revelation. It is true Satan has territorial claims. The earth is his domain. He was cast to earth raises a very intriguing question, what happens when we go to Mars? <laughs> Maybe we take him with us, but uh, it does say he is cast to earth. That's his territory. It's true in Revelation chapter 2, it says of Pergamum, it's the place where Satan has his throne. Also in Smyrna, Satan has the synagogue, it says. But if this idea of strategic level spiritual warfare against territorial spirits is true, I wonder why there is some silence in Scripture itself explicitly about this. Jesus drove demons out of people. He did not attack the demons over Capernaum or over Galilee, or over Samaria or over Jerusalem. By the way, the front line of spiritual warfare, Scripture tells us, is not preaching over the heads of the people to the demons and spirits. It's actually bringing people to Christ. That's the front line of spiritual warfare. Because that's what the battle is about. And so it seems to me that the biblical arguments for this are very weak and the anecdotal evidences are very mixed about this. We need to be careful always of establishing doctrine on the basis of experience rather than the explicit teaching of Scripture. Now this is a fairly new idea and uh, the old uh, maxim I think is, is probably true. If something's new, it's not true and if it's true, it won't be new because truth has been revealed in Scripture since it was given to us. But let's not throw the baby out with the bathwater. The devil is active. But our job is not to try and address and rebuke the spirits that may be over Toronto or Ontario or Canada. It is to reach the men and women and boys and girls who need to know Christ for themselves. That's our task. Thank you for joining Charles Price on today's program. 
Next week, join Living Truth for another topic from the series, Who's Who in the Cosmos. Charles Price teaches about demon deception. 